I know that we do have a lot of younger listeners um, who might not think that this is relevant, but my grandmother sadly passed away from Alzheimer's. So I saw her decline. Um, and I think it's one of the most saddest diseases for the family to watch unfold. Um, and I know a lot of dear friends at the moment even have their parents who have got dementia. I actually know that your mother at the moment has has dementia. So it's a very close subject for you and I, um, and for many people listening. Um and something that I'm really fascinated in, um, because we can get all these genetic tests now, and some people, you know, might think they've got a g- genetic predisposition to, to dementia, is around prevention of this, because we kind of look at this of when we've got it, what do we do? But actually, the more understanding we have of it earlier, the better the risk of not getting it or delaying that. So. That sounds like a big thing, but can you slow down or reverse dementia? Because it is something that is terrifying and we might not think about, but I think it's a really important conversation to touch upon. Well, as a medical professional, I will tell you that Alzheimer's, dementia is a big category. It's a descriptive category of, of um, a, a huge class of diseases where your brain is compromised and you're not able to... Uh, 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 your cognitive functions and some of your neurological functions are not operating within that normal boundary. That there's, again, deviation from resiliency. You go from being bounced back to slowly losing your grip on being able to be resilient, and then even losing your grip to be even functional at a baseline level. Uh, and by the way, we it's a, it's a gradient, right? So you know. Uh, when I was 20 years old, I could remember everything. Yeah. Right now, you know, I'm s- s- trying to figure out like, okay, where was that paper from? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So the brain okay. fog. Yeah. Well, it, okay. That's also a gradient, <laughs> but I will tell you that. So again, this idea of our brain being resilient, bouncing back, that's fine. All right. Where we, we really have difficulty. And I think this is what you're getting at is we all fear cognitive decline. We yeah. all fear this idea. Our brain isn't working properly. Um, Alzheimer's is a very specific disease, and many people who are said to have Alzheimer's may not actually have only might not actually have Alzheimer's. They may they need a neurologist to d- properly diagnose it. They may not have Alzheimer's may not be the only condition they have. They may have other things going on at the same time, mm-hmm. kind of a double whammy or multiple whammy that's affecting their brain function. Mm-hmm. Or they may have an altogether different neurological neurodegenerative condition that masquerades with some of the same symptoms as Alzheimer's. We call that dementia. Mm-hmm. But so rather than try to go for the diagnosis and then look for that magic pill that can actually reverse it or magic food that can reverse it, which is what people, you know, people that are watching that or listening, that's what they want. They were looking for that simple solution. Mm-hmm. I think prevention is really key especially in areas that we're still doing research and we don't under, fully have a full understanding of it. Okay, so what are the things that we know that are helpful for reversing dementia? We know that, uh, actually, before I go there, let me just say, what are the main things that actually put you at greatest risk for dementia? Okay, well, I told you many causes of dementia, many types of dementia, but I'll tell you, if you have a family history uh, of, of, of some uh, type of uh, neurodegeneration, some form of dementia, you're going to be at higher risk. Okay, uh, uh, Alzheimer's specifically, but I think that uh, other forms of dementia as well. Parkinson's being another one. Uh, Huntington's disease. ALS has a genetic component. Um, uh, I, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. I have a really, really dear friend of mine who um, has had this. Uh, could be genetic. All right, uh, uh, that's a risk factor. I think if you had head trauma, you know, uh, you played football. Yeah or hockey as a kid, uh, uh, or boxers, uh, uh, you know, uh, the repeated uh, head, uh, tra- uh, you know, the intracranial head trauma, mm-hmm. CTE, you know, that actually is a setup for la- loss of resiliency and, and, and improper brain function as you get older. And by the way, that's tied directly into mental illness as well. Wow. Depression, okay. uh, suicidal ideation, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, all those, all the symptoms come up, all right, in addition to cognitive defects. So again, lots of things are feeders uh, into this as another uh, risk factor. We also know, and this is actually more recent discovery, I think this is probably profound, uh, a profound recent discovery is that our, our gut health, our gut microbiome 
probably plays a gigantic role in maintaining that brain resiliency because, because we are finding in people with depression and cognitive disorders and Alzheimer's disease, okay, many of these uh, inability to recover from with you know brain not being resilient all the way to frank dementia, mm -hmm. Alzheimer's disease, you find changes in the gut microbiome. So if you study uh, 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 two groups of age match patients, and you study, and one, and you, one of the groups has Alzheimer's. The other group, same age, uh, same other features, don't have Alzheimer's. One of the major differences you find between the gr two groups is their gut microbiome is very, very different. There's dysbiosis or a sick gut bacteria, poor neighborhood, wow. unhealthy neighborhood in the patients with Alzheimer's. Is that cause or effect? Well, you know, more likely that is a contributory cause. You know, the brain didn't cause a bad microbiome. It's more likely the bad microbiome. Be and, and it could be that look, Alzheimer's brains are in intensely inflamed, mm -hmm. lots of inflammation, and, uh, and blood vessels growing in ways that are releasing toxins and not bringing better perfusion. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I published a paper on Alzheimer's in The Lancet in the year 2000 proposing that Alzheimer's has an angiogenesis component to it as well. And it's a very frequently cited paper. There's new, much more research to be done on that. You know, look, these are, these are deviations from normal, right? So gut microbiome, uh, head trauma, genetic family history. Uh, we don't know. There's so many other questions. Is it environmental exposures? Mm -hmm. Are there epigenetics that could actually make a difference? Mm -hmm. What about microplastics? you know, and nanoplastics, right? The, the credit cards that we're eating every single week, yeah. uh, unbeknownst in our food. So those and are- And I also was gonna say, yeah. before you go into the positives, sorry to interrupt, but we had James King Ross on the show who I spoke to you about who wrote Dark Matter and he was talking about fecal transplants and he was even saying there is now studies because you spoke about the gut microbiome where they are transferring fecal microbiome transplants into people with Alzheimer's and it's working which is quite mind-blowing. So when you're talking about the gut microbiome, it's a powerhouse. That's translational research at its yeah. best. Something that we know and that there's some positive benefits that we're seeing in the lab in animals, okay? Research data, animals aren't humans. We've cured cancer in animals many times. We're still working and struggling to get it to work reliably in humans. Uh, same thing in Alzheimer's. I think it's really exciting that they're translating that research to uh, uh, to humans. Well, let's talk about things that can lower your risk of, of cognitive uh, disorders uh, ranging from just, you know, having difficulty finding it, can't remember where your keys are, uh, or what you ate for dinner last night, to all the way to full-blown dementia. Mm -hmm. So again, accept the fact these are different diseases, yeah. different conditions. Are there things that I could generally say would lower risk? couple of things. Number one, um, better gut health is probably going to wind up being one of the central, it's probably going to be the bullseye. I think, you know, in 20 years, we're going to be looking back and say, why didn't we think of this a hundred years ago? Gut health, bad gut health, poor gut health is bad brain health. Uh, uh, so, and by the way, when does it start? It probably starts when we're, when we're children. So, for all the parents out there, younger people who you know have younger kids, you're saying, ah, eh, you know, they got the rest of their lives to figure it out. Wrong. We, when we're uh, uh, thinking about making decisions, when young parents are making young parents are making decisions for young children, they may be actually casting their fate, both positive and negative, at a very very early age. And so I think getting kids onto good dietary patterns that foster better gut health. They're going to be thanking you when you're long gone, okay? Because their gut microbiome will be healthier. Their brain will probably be healthier as well. And you're right. There are lots of research studies, clinical research studies, being able to look at this now to see what we can actually um, getting more evidence to have a better understanding of. It. So number one, gut health. So all the things related to gut health: better better diet, less ultra processed foods, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera. Number two, regular physical activity. Everyone feels, you know, when you're younger, you feel like, you know what, I want to be in shape. I'm going to join a gym. Some people say, I want to get a trainer. And you look in the mirror and you look pretty good. Look, uh, 
that is uh, something that people can do in a certain window in their lives. But really, being physically active is something that we can actually do our entire lives. Mm -hmm. And that's what's important is consistent, regular physical behavior. Look, kids are running around all the time. They're bouncing off the walls, right? Teenagers are super active. Young adults, you're rushing off to work. You know, you're zipping around going out to events and parties and, you know, things like that. When you get to middle age, you're tired. You know, there's things happening to you. You sort of, you're worn down. And, and a lot of those physical activity things that you might we might have otherwise done, we slow down on. I would encourage people to keep up your physical activity. Be mindful of your movement, right? Movement. But I even think the younger generation, because a lot of us can sit behind laptops all day for nine hours and we don't move. And then we think a 20-minute run is going to solve the movement crisis. Well, as it's, we're not in a crisis, but you know, tick all of our boxes of movement, but actually we're probably getting less because we're sitting down all day. Right. Well, that's, you know, that's bringing up a, not only the kind of the laptop phenomenon. Look, if you're, if you're a laptop, yeah, but if you're mobile, you can still walk when you're yeah. on mobile. Yeah, totally. However, now we're talking about another dimension, which is blue light that shines out of our devices that interferes with our sleep. So after physical activity, well, I'm going to get to the sleep part, staying in motion is really important throughout your whole life. Not only is it important for, uh, brain health, but it's important for overall mobility as well. You know, um, somebody once told me that, you know, as we get older, when we're young, younger, we can, you know, climb on walls like Spider-Man. But when you get older, you don't think about doing that anymore. And yet, if you think about um, like a like a leopard in the jungle, it's hunting. It is pouncing from tree to tree branch to tree branch its entire life. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to hunt or eat. That's kind of what we need to be able to actually do is to stay limber, stay agile, and, and stay in motion. That has been shown to improve vascular health, blood vessel health, which then, of course, addresses the blood-brain barrier, which then also uh, directly addresses the circulation in the brain. More movement brings better blood flow just by the nature of movement. So stay in motion.